U.S. has actually not lost a lot of its power in any meaningful sense. The U.S.'s percentage of global GDP, today China is 17 to 18 percent of global GDP. That kind of rise in economic power naturally is going to have some pillover effect in political and diplomatic power. And China, by the way, has built its military mightily as well. The U.S. is largely uh, self-sufficient. In fact, the U.S. is now the largest producer of liquid hydrocarbons in the world, more than Saudi Arabia more than Russia. The U.S. and China do $2 billion of trade every day. But what I mean is you need a crisis to shock people into realizing the stakes are very high here. The dangers are very high. Hello and welcome to Infer Talks, a podcast where we put you in the room with some of the biggest thought leaders from around the world. Joining us today for this special edition of Infer Talks is a special guest. He's a globally renowned thinker a journalist. You know him from his program, Global Public Square. You have guessed it right. We have Dr. Farid Zakaria. My second guest is Dr. Moid Yusuf, who served as a national security advisor. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Zakaria, let me go ahead and indulge you uh, in our conversation, first of all. And let me ask you, um, you know, the state of U.S. foreign policy, we see it waning especially in the last two decades, and particularly U.S. as a global power has seen its influence waning. Uh, what do you think could be the reasons behind it? You know, I wrote a book about this uh, in 2008 called The Post-American World. And the first line of the book is, this is, this is not a book about the decline of America, but rather the rise of everyone else. And I think that is the central operating paradigm and dynamic we have to think about which is that largely what is happening in the world is the rise of other countries that have uh, until now been sort of uh, pawns on the chessboard uh, played by somebody else, played by the Soviet Union, the United States. And what's happening is that these countries are becoming powerful uh, regional powers on their own, in some cases more than regional powers, and that is what is changing the dynamic of international relations more than anything else. So if you think about a country like Turkey, 30 years ago, Turkey was a dependable client state of the United States. Its economy was a mess. Uh, it was run by the Turkish military. When the United States asked it to do something, it just did it. You know, it jumped. When the United States asked it to jump, it said, how high? Today, Turkey is a completely different country. Its economy, its per capita GDP has gone up 600%, six times higher than it was. It is a consolidated democracy. It has a very powerful leader. And as a result, it has a will of its own and it pursues its interests as it sees fit, not always, by the way, very wisely, but the point is it pushes back. Now, that dynamic is true of Turkey, of Saudi Arabia, of uh, India, of Pakistan, of Brazil. You know, there is, a, there is a whole group of these countries that have become much more willful, much more economically powerful, culturally, culturally proud, politically active. Top of that list, of course, is China, and we'll get to that dynamic. But I think that it's really important to understand that it's a, much, it's a global phenomenon, and it's what I call the rise of the rest. And operating in that world is a very different thing. The U.S. has actually not lost a lot of its power in any meaningful sense. The U.S.'s percentage of, of global GDP 30 years ago was about 25 percent. It's 25 percent now. Uh, it's, you know, military continues to dominate the world. Its technology base is still the best in the world. But what's different is this dynamic of the rise of the rest. Then, uh, Dr. Zakaria, would it also be true for critics to say that the U.S. has perhaps lost its uh, moral legitimacy as, a, as the leader of the global order, uh, especially in recent decades with wars in Iraq and Afghanistan? Do you think, is there any truth to that? Look, the United States um, has always had this complicated uh, relationship with, uh, with international order and morality and such, which is that it is uh, it is often trying to maintain some kind of rules-based international order, uh, and often it, it acts in that way 
in ways that are not always seen as legitimate by others. You know, so there is this dynamic where the U.S. thinks it's trying to maintain uh, order and 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 spread good values. The rest of the world sometimes disagrees. This happened in Vietnam. This happened in Iraq. This happened, I think, to a lesser extent in Afghanistan because there the the contrast between the Taliban and the U.S. was was more uh, dramatic. Um, but I think there has been a kind of revival, if you will, of of uh, of uh, moral legitimacy over Ukraine. I think on Ukraine, there is a much greater sense that this is a just uh, intervention, that what the countries that are aiding the Ukraine are, are doing is legitimate. There are lots of countries which do not want to participate, and they have their own uh, national self-interested reasons for doing so, India most prominently. But even there, what I'm struck by, I was in India in uh, December, there is a broad acceptance that the Ukrainians are the, are the victims, the tragic victims, the Russians are the aggressors, the West is doing something, broadly speaking, that is legitimate. So I think that Ukraine has changed the dynamic you were describing, uh, which I think was set in place uh, with Iraq. Uh, I think also as you go forward, the contrast between the U.S. and China, again, provides for a little bit of remoralization of foreign policy, where uh, I noticed that even in Europe, a lot of European countries are quite critical of the U.S., but when they then contrast it with China, they find themselves closer to America than they than they might have expected to be. Uh, Dr. Zakaria, if such is the case, as you pointed out, then how would you actually explain China taking so much prominence in terms of, you know, being the deal maker, say in case of uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia, and the Chinese foreign ministry has also said that it would be interested in brokering peace between Israel and Palestine. How do you then explain China's growing pre uh, preeminence or prominence in foreign policy or diplomacy? So China in 1990 was 1.5% of global GDP. Today, China is 17 to 18% of global GDP. Um, that kind of rise in economic power naturally is going to have some uh, uh, spillover effect in political and diplomatic power. And China, by the way, has built its military mightily as well. In the Middle East in particular, the dynamic I was describing uh, is really a foot, which is to say the post-American Middle East, because the United States has consciously withdrawn from the Middle East in order to focus on Asia and 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 then Europe. Um, the truth of the matter is the US, U.S. at this point does not import o almost any oil or from the middle from the Middle East. The U.S. is largely uh, self-sufficient. In fact, the U.S. is now the largest producer of liquid hydrocarbons in the world more than Saudi Arabia, more than Russia. So what is happening in the Middle East is a new dynamic is, is, is afoot, uh, a jockeying for power among the regions, uh, uh, regional powers, essentially a contest between Iran and Saudi Arabia with the Turks and the Israelis trying to maintain their own interests within that context. And in that new post-American dynamic, uh, China, which is now the largest importer of oil, of energy from the Middle East, has become a very important player. So I entirely uh, agree with you that China has become much more uh, important as as it should, uh, as the natural consequence of its economic power. I would say this is a turn in Chinese foreign policy, which has so far, under Xi Jinping, been quite unsuccessful. I mean, if you think about China's foreign policy under Xi Jinping, it has managed to uh, alienate uh, Australia, to the point where the Australians have been willing to take incredible economic pain, uh, and you know, in order to stand up to China, it alienated India completely pointlessly over the uh, the the clash in the Him uh, Himalayas, which resulted in Chinese investment into India being frozen. It has alienated Vietnam. It alienated the Philippines, with which it had a good relationship, and the Philippines now is back in the in the U.S. fold. It has alienated Japan to the extent that Japan is going through a major rearmament, which is probably one of the most significant factors uh, in, in Asian geopolitics. 
It has alienated South Korea. So uh, if you look at Xi Jinping's foreign policy over the last 10 years, frankly, he has managed to, you know, to, to, uh, to sort of uh, junk all the goodwill that China had uh, gained under Deng Xiaoping and, and, uh, and his successors by uh, keeping a low profile, not being overly aggressive. Uh, I think they've had a good couple of months, uh, the Chinese, but there's a lot of work that they have to undo, which is still you know, costing them a lot. The relations with China, with Japan, with South Korea, with India, with Australia are still in pretty bad shape. On this point, uh, Dr. Zakaria, let me go ahead and indulge uh, Dr. Moit. Dr. Moit, you know, we see so much of friction growing between U.S. and China and also at a regional level between China and other players. Then for a country like Pakistan, how could Pakistan balance its relations with the United States and China as well? Thank you, Sama. Um, let me come to your question, but if, if you allow me, just make a couple of comments on what, what Farid has said. You know, the interesting part of uh, today's sort of geopolitical reality and, and so the rise of the others that Farid talks about uh, in his book, um, the U.S. actually helped create that rise, including in the case of China. Uh, I mean, the, this entire sort of Chinese miracle, if you will, and in some ways, uh, you know, the, the number of people China has pulled out of poverty is, is truly miraculous. Um, that's really a function of Western investment going into China and China becoming sort of the manufacturing uh, floor of the world. Uh, so, I mean, you know, in that sense, that integration of the two economies uh, still gives me some hope because, you know, the pain of pulling away from each other is going to be simply um, impossible to bear, not only for both these economies, but frankly, for much of the world. I mean, we saw in covid uh, China was closed, supply chains were disrupted around the world. Um, you know, so so that I think is an important point to keep in mind. That said, I'll also say that China has, um, if you will, moved to a completely different paradigm. Uh, I, I think this is where uh, Farid talks about, you know, alienating countries. I think that was a natural course of China coming out of that hiding phase, developing the economy, lying low and then sort of announcing itself to the world in terms of Machiavellian geopolitics, if you will. And I think that um, has both positives and negatives. I mean, it has a rough side to it, which is what Farid talks about. It may have some positives, which the Iran, Middle East, uh, Saudi Arabia kind of rapprochement um, has, has shown us. So I, I think we're at a very delicate moment in global geopolitics. And that's sort of my segue uh, into your question. You know, I have maintained now for some time, including when I was um, in, in the Pakistani government till last year, that the number one foreign policy challenge for countries like Pakistan, it's not only Pakistan, but countries like Pakistan is going to be to navigate this great power contestation. Uh, you can't afford to become the grass that's going to be trampled by the elephants in this case, right? And here, I think Pakistan is in a slightly unique situation and a very, very sort of um, even more delicate than many other countries. And that's because, and I've explained this on your program before, Pakistan's entire economic output, virtually entire economic output goes to the West. Uh, our export market, uh, investments coming from the West. But um, virtually all our inputs have over time started coming from China. So we are totally dependent on both blocks. And that is why Pakistan's sort of push uh, for no camp politics for a conversation about cooperation in our region, for a conversation on how to bring both camps to come and invest in Pakistan. The challenge, Osama, of course, is that the uh, rhetoric of, of the great power contestation and the conversation between the big players has taken us over. So we don't have everything in our control. You know, when Pakistan says we don't want to be in any camp, we have a special relationship with China, we want to keep that going. We have an extremely important relationship with the West and have been a frontline ally of the years. We want to keep that going. The problem is that the world doesn't see it that way. The West sees Pakistan in China's camp. China sees, uh, you know, thinks that we are not close enough to China. And that's, I think, the um, struggle for Pakistani policymakers that they will have to deal with. I think we do have options. Uh, I think both China and U.S. benefit if Pakistan becomes a um, sort of hub of connectivity for the region to lower the temperatures uh, and sort of work with both countries. I'm not thinking of a grand sort of entry into the fray like we did in 1771 with Kissinger's trip to China. But I think, you know, smaller pieces which we can work on. Can we connect South Asia, North-South 
CPEC, Afghanistan. Can the U.S. invest in Afghanistan? Can China invest in Pakistan? I mean, there's some uh, some sort of work to be done there. But if we don't do that, trust me, the problem is that there are going to be so many countries in Pakistan's position that are going to become a proxy uh, battlefield uh, for this contestation. It's not going to be good for anybody. But but Dr. Moeed, you know, in D.C., there is a growing perception that Pakistan has perhaps moved too closely in China's camp. Do you agree with this asset assessment in that case? You know, uh, I'll be honest. One of my biggest struggles um, at the time I was in government was really to have this conversation with, with the West um, and with China to explain that Pakistan is not taking an altruistic position when it says, you know, we want to be this sort of cooperative hub. We have no option. As I explained to you, we're so dependent on both sides. Uh, you know, our geographical sort of contiguity with China CPEC is a major investment. It is something that's opened up Pakistan's energy, Pakistan's infrastructure. You know, the West has to understand and acknowledge that. At the same time, Pakistan's export market is integrated with the West. Um, you know, much of our sort of uh, culture is integrated with the West. We have to work with Gulf countries that are also sort of balancing this equation. So uh, we are just trying to make sure that the world is patient and understands why Pakistan is explaining that it wants to now move to a geoeconomic paradigm. You know, it's the world, if the irony here is that it's the entire world constantly um, counseled Pakistan to talk broadly about national security and talk about geoeconomics and look at that space. Our national security policy last year has enunciated that absolutely clearly, that that's where we are going, that's where we want to go. Now what we are seeking is support from the world to push us in this direction of a um, sort of geoeconomic first kind of policy, if you will. Do you think then there is a possibility that consensus can be built around by Pakistan on different issues between U.S. and China to ensure that at least in its backyard and at least on its turf, you do not see a manifestation of that contestation? No, I think the contestation is here to stay and Pakistan by itself can't do this. I mean, I, I think there have been a number of countries who have to come together on, on this platform. Uh, I think one prerequisite to Sama simply is that Pakistan has to be internally stable and strong for, for any conversation with the world uh, that allows it to play that kind of role and avoid uh, becoming victim uh, to this competition. But I don't think it's for Pakistan alone to do, but, but at least in terms of where we want to go, uh, we want to keep making this clear. I think one caution I would put on the table, and I, I don't know whether Fareed would agree or not, in Pakistan there has been a, a, a worry or a sense that because the West believes Pakistan is in China's camp, uh, we're almost being pushed into China's camp. I mean, there's a bit of a give up on Pakistan syndrome. Uh, and we've tried very hard to make sure that that's understood, um, that that is not the case. Um, and, and even with China, frankly, uh, I will say neither China nor US has ever asked us uh, to pick a side and, and you know, just completely give up on the other. But increasingly, as the temperature rises, this is going to, be, uh, this is going to become a very difficult balancing act. Dr. Farid, now let me indulge you once again and come back to you. Uh, you know, there's this suspicion that U.S. and China are headed on a collision course, and you warned against this too in your recent write-ups. Why can't we break this cycle? Uh, is dialogue now a lost cause? Um, look, I think I, I agree with everything uh, Moeed said about this. There, 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 there is a fundamental geopolitical reality that these are the two most powerful countries in the world. Uh, it is also true that this is a very new phenomenon where because until now, the if you think about since 1945, the United States created global order uh, has largely uh, allowed for the rise of countries that are already closely allied with the United States. You know, so what are the countries that rose after 45? Japan, Germany, South Korea, Taiwan. These are all close treaty allies with the United States who owe their security existence to the U.S. nuclear umbrella. China is the first country outside of that to have risen, and it has risen spectacularly, partly because of the extraordinary growth uh, in energy, but partly just the sheer size of China, right? So we have a new phenomenon, and we have these as a result. You know, this is as uh, dynamic as old as Thucydides and the, and the Athenian and Spartan rivalry. The, the question is, and I think, again, we put this exactly right. This time it is happening in the context of a global economy that is extraordinarily well integrated. 
We've never had a global economy that is as integrated and as open as this one. So the cost of a kind of economic decoupling would be very, very substantial, not just, by the way, to Pakistan, but to it, to the United States and China. U.S. and China do a massive amount of trade with one another. At the height of the Cold War, uh, when you looked at U.S.-Soviet trade, it was about $2 billion a year. U.S. and China do $2 billion of trade every day. That's the level of difference between the two. So it would be very painful to completely uh, disentangle and, uh, you know, uh, as, as Moeed was saying, to force countries to really choose. And it's not even clear how you would go about doing that because at the end of the day, unless you really return to a, to a world of massively high tariffs and border boundaries and restrictions, uh, at the end of the day, Pakistan is going to be able to export to whatever country wants to buy its stuff. As, and as, you know, as long as we're roughly speaking in a, in a world of low, you know, of low tariffs and open uh, economic uh, exchange, it's very difficult to see how that happens. So you would need a real, a real shift in the paradigm of global economics. Now, what that means is we are left in this very complex, uh, nerve-wracking, uh, hair-raising world in which we are economically very integrated, but increasingly geop geopolitically very hostile. So you know, when I talk to American CEOs. They say, you know, we listen to this rhetoric and we, when we, we hear what's going on between the two sides politically and geopolitically. And we are, you know, we hold our breath because, you know, one of them says to me, I've got, I've got seven and a half thousand people working in China and I've got 30% of my profits coming from there. Somebody else says, you know, I've been, I am importing all my, you know, uh, my, my uh, goods from China. And so how do I, how do I make sense of this? And that's what everyone is puzzling. Is there a stable equilibrium for this situation where you are deep economic penetration and, and interdependence, but rising geopolitical confrontation? So, Dr. Zakaria, as a consequence, then, one suspects U.S. and China are on a collision course. Then my question is, how do we then resume a dialogue between U.S. and China and can guardrails be placed to prevent this collision? Theoretically, they can. The problem is practically it's very difficult, right? Because what happens is, I'll give you an example of the last few, you know, it's the six months. Mm -hmm. So the U.S.-China relationship got hotter and hotter, and both sides realized they needed to uh, to calm it down and put guardrails in. And then Biden meets with Xi in Bali with that expressed intention on both sides, and they begin a process of rapprochement. And then Tony Blinken is going to go to China. And then this balloon comes up, right? And it derails everything because on both sides, there's domestic politics. On the U.S. side, I think it's fair to say that the Biden people felt they were trapped. There was, you know, they could not, given that this was a visible sign of Chinese uh, interference in, in, in the U.S., they had to do something dramatic uh, and shoot it down. And then on the Chinese side, they felt they had to angrily protest. And in that context, it becomes very difficult to have the Secretary of State visit. So now that has all been put on the back burner. So this is the danger, you know, that there's, a, you can theoretically imagine a way of putting guardrails in and things like that. I suspect, unfortunately, that what we will, what we need is something like um, a Cuban Missile Crisis. And I don't say this lightly because the Cuban Missile Crisis was a hair-raising episode that almost led to nuclear war. But what I mean is you need a crisis to shock people into realizing the stakes are very high here. The dangers are very high. Right now, both sides are casually assuming that you can ratchet up these tensions, which, by the way, plays well domestically in both countries. You know, she has gained a lot of political ground in China by being the tough guy, by being the Chinese nationalist. You know, his his strategy to outmaneuvering his rivals has been, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a, a tougher on the, on the, on, uh, I, I'm a sort of nationalist abroad, and I'm a communist at home. You know, I'm, a, I'm more of a true red communist at home. I'm cracked down on the free market, and I'm willing to stand up for China abroad. 
Well, th- you know, that works in most countries, unfortunately. And that's the that's the difficulty. Dr. Zakria, it's important. Uh, it's it's quite, uh, you know, quite pertinent that you mentioned this uh, spy balloon incident. In crises like these, don't you think it's important to then have a discussion about confidence building measures between U.S. and China to insulate the two sides from heading towards a collision course or an accidental conflict as a consequence of such crises? Yeah, you're absolutely right. Now, this is an area where, honestly, the Chinese have been much more difficult than the U.S. So the U.S. has uh, uh, wanted to resume military-to-military dialogue. The Chinese have said no. The U.S. has asked if there could be arms control conversations uh, with the Chinese on their nuclear buildup. Uh, The Chinese have said no. Uh, When the spy balloon thing happened, the defense secretary reached out to his Chinese counterpart God, no, you know, they literally did not pick up the phone. Um, so the Chinese are, I, I think this is a point Moeed was making, which is very true, which is the Chinese have decided that the time of Deng's hiding and biding, you know, bide your strength, hide your, hide your strength, bide your time is over. Um, and what they're now going to do is, is build up and not have much of a dialogue uh, while they are building up. Uh, but it's a very dangerous idea, and I think that they they would be wise to they will do what they wish to do in terms of building up their arsenal. But there's no reason not to have a dialogue about it because the 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 points the dialogue can can clarify are I think as you were suggesting, miscalculations, misunderstandings, accidental launches, notification, you know, all the things that the U.S. and the Soviets worked out over over years and decades. Uh, but the Chinese are right now unwilling to do that. I think there is a there is a feeling in China that any kind of dialogue will inevitably mean a kind of limitation on China's ability to modernize its ar- arsenal. Um, and I think that that does not necessarily have to be the way they view it. They could they could uh, understand that there are these whole, whole other set of you know, of issues on which there can be fruitful dialogue whatever they're going to do in terms of ultimate numbers. Dr. Moyes, let me come back to you for a very brief question. Uh, you know, in, in circumstances like these, how do you then see uh, Pakistan, you know, charting out a way for itself in terms of balance, balancing its uh, relations between the U.S. and China? So, first of all, I think we have to be clear the balance is not a 50-50 balance. I mean, basically what we have to be clear about is that there are serious engagements with both sides and very, very sort of important special uh, aspects of the relationship, right? But um, what Pakistan can or cannot do is going to be uh, the function of another thing. And I think that's an aspect which I want to add to what Farida said, perhaps. Uh, I recently spent some time uh, in China. Of course, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the U.S. I find one very dangerous um, element to this uh, contestation, rivalry, whatever you want to call it, a communication gap. I think this is very new for both. I mean, we all know Alaska happened and the, and the dialogue there was a bit of a disaster, but but that's the official dialogue. I think we are headed towards a security dilemma um, because both sides are misinterpreting or perhaps reading way too much into what the other side is saying. You know, if you look at the learning curve of the Cold War, the Soviet Union and the U.S. also took time to get to a point where they understood what the red lines were. This is also going to be the same. It's too new. But I, as somebody who sort of uh, perhaps, you know, has some understanding of, of the U.S. lingo, if you will, and trying very hard to understand China's position and, and sort of engaging with them uh, during my past two or three years in, in government, I think the problem is not as big as the understanding of the problem on both sides. And that's the classic definition of a security dilemma. It's in the mind. You start believing that things are much worse and the threat is much greater than it is. And frankly, uh, as a student of uh, strategic um, sort of policy and, and strategy, I think that's the toughest one to break through. If there is hard, If there are hard facts on the ground, you can still debate those. When this gets into the mind and psychology, it's very difficult. And I find that happening in this relation. That's why as 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 uh, somebody sitting in Pakistan and looking at this and even South Asia and other countries, I am now intellectually committed to spending a lot of time and effort trying to see if we can start a 
dialogue of um, uh, you know ex officials, of intellectuals, of people who matter, people like Farid and others, to talk about what do countries like Pakistan and others do for the benefit of the world. How do we lower the temperature of this of this relationship? We can't you know do it on our own as a country, but I think there is serious need for for countries and individuals who understand both sides to start a conversation. Uh, and and try and lower this sort of communication gap, if you will. Otherwise, I'm afraid, um, you know, things are not as bad as as they're uh, being perceived to be. And that's a dangerous situation for the world. But also, countries like Pakistan then can't do much because then you sit and watch this become a, a bigger beast than it should. Gentlemen, let's Mohit, pick can up. I, can I? Yes, sir. Can I ask uh, Moeed a question? Sure, sure. In the context of our conversation, mm -hmm. um, are you therefore quite pessimistic? Uh, about the prospects of any kind of peace path between India and Pakistan? Yeah, India and Pakistan is another story for it. Yes, uh, I, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm on record and I, I, I really get depressed saying this, but I'll say it. India is one country or India-Pakistan is one relationship where my view changed drastically when I was in government because I got to see things um, inside and work on things and deal with things which told me that um, it's going to be very difficult to break this log jam. And, and it, dare I say that I found um, that the current Indian government is purely ideological on Pakistan. I think there's a different part of the brain that operates for the rest of the, the neighbors and perhaps other relationships. With Pakistan, it's, it's uh, I don't know, it's almost irrational. I mean, it's, it's about how can Pakistan act as a state at parity with India, or even presume to do that. And when you get into that space with the kind of history we have, yes, I'm, I'm very, very pessimistic. I'm also worried that as this global dynamic is changing, uh, the US is, I don't think it's as well positioned uh, as it was to play mediator in crises between India and Pakistan, right? I mean, I wrote a whole book, as you know, in 2018, talking about this relationship and the US role. I don't think the Chinese are ready, and I don't think the, the Americans are there anymore. And so I think there's a bit of a vacuum in that space. But overall, in terms of conflict resolution, I just find uh, the current Indian government having a very warped view of uh, of Pakistan and perhaps what, what should happen in, in the relationship. It's a very, very sad tale for somebody who's advocated the need for, for a better relationship all my academic life, frankly. All right, Dr. Zakaria, it's quite interesting that you spoke of India and Pakistan. So let me ask you a question about India. Despite claims of multi-aligned policy, it appears to be becoming, uh, you know, India, on the other hand, actually appears to be becoming part of camp politics. Do you think that this is something beneficial for India, the, the region as a whole, and for that matter, the state of global politics? What's your take on that? India is actually trying to maintain a kind of multi-aligned uh, uh, foreign policy. If you look at um, the, the U Ukraine war, you can see it very clearly. Uh, the Indian India has not condemned Russia. It continues to buy Russian arms. Ninety percent of advanced weaponry in India is imported from Russia. Uh, they continue to buy Russian oil. They are essentially not abiding by the uh, the sanctions. They've never claimed that they would. Uh, and in fact, India, China, Turkey are probably the three largest, most active uh, uh, countries uh, assisting Russia. On, this, on the other hand, India is, of course, more closely aligned with the United States when it comes to issues relating to China. I, I think my, uh, my own view has always been that India can play this game up to a point that at some point India needs to decide uh, where it's... Uh, you know, where its DNA is. And it makes more sense for India to be more closely aligned with the U.S., at, le at the very least economically and technologically. Because what's go what's increasingly happening, and I'd like to to know what Moeed thinks about this, is while it's going to be very difficult to have an actual decoupling of the world economy, it's too interconnected, you are going to have a decoupling of, of technology. You are going to essentially have two technology ecosystems in the world. Uh, a U.S. one and a Chinese one. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult to pick and choose between them because each side is going to insist that there be a kind, kind of coherence. So the, the Americans are going to say, if you want U.S. military assistance, if you want U.S. military 
uh, protection, if you want U.S. military engagement, uh, then no Huawei, no, you know, no uh, WeChat, no, it'd be, they're going to be with no, 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 larger and larger number of groups like that. And the Chinese on the other side are going to say, if you want Belt and Road Initiative, then you do have to take Huawei. You do have to take the... So that dilemma is one which I believe the Indians will resolve by choosing U.S. technology platforms. Um, but that is one Pakistan will have to grapple with. So far, Pakistan is actually... Most people don't un realize this in India. Pakistan is actually much more open uh, as an economy. I mean, if you look at... In, Pakistan never went through the kind of crazy socialist phase in the 70s that India went through and is still painfully climbing out of. Uh, if you look at the World Bank's ease of doing business index, Pakistan is always higher than India, often substantially higher. So pa for Pakistan, it'll be harder because you are, as Mui was saying, you're more integrated into the in, in some ways into the global economy and into Western eco uh, eco economies than India is. And so if there is this de technological decoupling, it presents a greater problem for Pakistan than India. Uh, Dr. Moy, do you want to say, chip in? Yeah, just quickly, you know, I'll give you an anecdote, which uh, which sort of, I think, explains where we are and, and the problem. Um, there was an NGO, uh, Pakistan-based NGO, that was uh, telling me that uh, they got some uh, funding for some project from the U.S., except that the contract that they got said that if you're using any Chinese technology, then you are not uh, eligible for this funding. And I asked them, so what's the definition of technology? And it was as simple as a Huawei uh, router in uh, in the office using internet, uh, right? So I think this could become a nightmare, not only for countries um, like Pakistan, but frankly for global business. I mean, uh, the the CEOs that you were talking about earlier, uh, they are not going to be able to manage this because virtually there's virtually no office in the world that doesn't have both technological inputs at this point. So I think that's also, those are also areas where we really need to have a dialogue and understand what the red lines are. It's clear, you know, chip manufacturing, all of that. I mean, the high end is going to go in two parallel worlds, but not everything has to, you know. But uh, Osama, if you allow me, I, I, I want to ask for one question. Um, yes. So this is an intellectually sort of difficult one for me to understand for you, from where I sit. But what is the linkage between where India is going or will end up? And what is happening domestically inside India? You know, the the sort of shift in terms of curbs on media, the sort of communal tensions that are now boiling over. Clearly, there's a societal social contract kind of um, shift. Is that going to become a drag at some point uh, in terms of what India can do? Uh, will the world, I mean, I've seen criticism coming out of the West, which wasn't there when I used to be in, in Washington, in terms of human rights, whether it's Kashmir or other places. Is India worried? Should we be worried? Or is, is am I exaggerating this? Look, if you ask at a practical level, um, th those uh, those tendencies within India that you're describing have not had much spillover internationally. In fact, Modi has been remarkably competent uh, on the international stage. If you think about it, he's managed relations with the Gulf states extremely well. They are very supportive of him. He's also managed uh, relations with Israel very well. Mm -hmm. Netanyahu and he have a very close relationship. He's maintained good relations with the West while maintaining, as I said, uh, uh, the, the bond with Russia. Um, even with China, don't forget, India does twice as much trade with China as it does with the U.S. So back mm -hmm. to, our, to, to the point about the complexity of the situation. So, so far, I think Modi has not uh, 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 faced any pushback there's been a little bit, as you say, you know, from the West, but very minor. Um, look, India is a democracy. One one hopes that over time there are, you know, uh, there are there are uh, there are waves and pushbacks, and you know, this the, the no policy goes in in one direction forever in a democracy, and there there's some cost correction. Uh, you know, I think that the South is a, is always an area where you see have you have seen historically a pushback against too much kind of Hindu majoritarianism. Um, even when the Congress did it in the in the nineteen sixties, that was where the original opposition to kind of Congress hegemony came from on the on the issue of language and you know the the imposition of Hindi. So, you know, I always believe in a in a functioning democracy that one has to hope that you have 
internal dynamics that that cause that create cost corrections. But I think as a practical matter, one has to one has to acknowledge that Modi has had a very successful foreign policy that has not been affected by the by the you know the things that people worry about at home, the curve, the restrictions on in, on media or the not the 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 way in which uh, independent media has been uh, uh, has 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 eroded, the way in which NGO activity has eroded, the way in which the independence of the judiciary has been eroded, none of that has had much spillover. Dr. Zakaria and Dr. Moid, let me now come to our final question. And this is more about projections. So a question for both of you. In light of everything we've talked about, where do you think the world is headed in the next 10 or 15 years? Could you shed light on what the future of the globe looks like? <laughs> That's a very small question, Osama. Uh, you know, I think that one makes a mistake when one thinks about these kind of predictions in assuming that there is a future out there that is already set and that it's the task of people like Moeed or me or other smart people to, to, to tell the world what it is. Uh, but there is no set future out there. It depends on our actions, and it depends on what course we take. So if the United States and China continue to go down a path of increasing confrontation, I think you have a world that looks much more like the Cold War. And, you know, real divisions, real divided e e e economics, not just politics. Uh, alternatively, if you have a world in which there is a greater sense of understanding that there has to be some greater degree of dialogue and cooperation, then I think you have a, a, a very different world, one where there will be geopolitical rivalries and tensions, but within which there are guardrails, within which there's a sense that economics is allowed to flourish, um, and I think that's a better world. It's a world in which more people will be lifted out of poverty. More countries will be able to participate in the world. But I can't tell you because I don't actually think that there is, you know, that future has not yet been set. We will set it. Dr. Moy. It's clear that we are heading towards more and more contestation. Um, I feel frustrated because I think this is not necessary. There are better ways to handle this. But as I said, I think it's new. The communication gap is there. My own sense is there's going to be a fairly large pressure block of countries in the world who would want to keep the two giants from colliding because the economic losses, as I said, are just going to be too huge. Um, and at some point, this is going to hurt to the point where everybody would want to uh, calm things down. That said, I will also say that the world is headed to um, a sort of camp formulation and, and this contestation when issues like climate change, issues like natural disasters, we've never seen. Um, they're unprecedented, the scale at which they're hitting us. Now, if we are sensible enough to isolate them and deal with them outside of this contestation in some ways, we may be okay uh, as a global community. But if they become part of this Machiavellian politics, um, I'm afraid this sort of business of climate change and natural disasters that, that we're seeing again and again in the world now uh, will essentially sweep everything aside. I mean, we may not be able to manage this globe unless we can sensibly cooperate, big and small powers. And my biggest worry is that I'm beginning to see more lip service than action in that space. That, to me, I think is probably the, the frontier to cross first. If we manage that, I think there'll be other opportunities to cooperate as well. Dr. Farid, Dr. Moeb, it's been a pleasure and a privilege hosting both of you on Infer Talks today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for staying with us through this conversation with Dr. Farid Zakaria and Dr. Moeb Yusuf. Our team works very hard to make this work possible, and it would mean the world to us if you could like and share our content to show your support. And if you'd like to stay informed, on upcoming podcasts and other work, please hit the bell icon.